Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. Since Ukraine war news update, first part there are for the 19th of May 2024. Uh, quite a lot to get through, another busy night over occupied territories of Ukraine and also over and into Russia. Uh, we're going to start with where we normally start, the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before all the usual caveats apply, you can find them in the description to the video below. Some incredibly high numbers across some of these categories. Um, starting with personnel, 1,210 is is very high, but it is lower than we have seen it over the past week or so. Uh, but still well above the 1,000 mark, sort of benchmark that we often have intuitively. Uh, it signifies that I think it's very active along the front line in a number of these key places, all those same places still fairly dynamic. 16 tanks is a heavy tank loss in a single day. 35 armoured personnel vehicles, 48 artillery systems, and really high numbers across both of all those categories, really. Thierry sent me a message the other day saying these are the losses for this month. Just in one month, the Russians will the Russian losses equate to basically what most European uh, nations would have as their main kind of army. So just the kind of like May losses uh, would knock out Britain or France or Germany in terms of you know most of their working vehicles. Just quite incredible losses, and that's going on month after month. Right, three multiple launch rocket systems, a two anti-aircraft warfare system, so that's fairly heavy in those categories because there aren't so many of them, and they're high-value high uh, pieces of kit. So the average, as you can see, you know, if we've had two years of war and a little bit, the average is just less than two a day. So two, two uh, losses there is pretty... Uh, bad for anti-aircraft of course it depends what they are 82 vehicles and fuel tanks is a huge number in that category not the highest interestingly i don't think but still very high and two pieces of special equipment remember you can check out the averages across these categories and the uh, the trends over the whole of the war in the the two of the links down below so you've got dell's statistics where he takes the general staff figures and puts them into graphs. And you've got Bill's stats where he's got a dashboard and looks at the daily numbers. And then you can go back or forward in, back in time. Uh, you can't go forward in time. Um, and you can check out the averages and highs and lows and all sorts of different ways of looking at these figures. So check, check them out in the description below. Then we're going to go to Andrew Perpetua's loss stats. And we're back to some pretty uh, significant losses, especially if you take those decoys out, uh, those purple ones on the left. Then you're looking at a 5 to 1 loss ratio, 4, 4 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1 maybe. Uh, really, really significant losses for the Russians again after a few days of pretty much, well, there was near parity, then there was sort of 2 to 1, which isn't quite enough for the Ukrainians, and we're back to a very, uh, very good day uh, ratio-wise for the Ukrainians. However, it, let, we need to look at the value of these bits of kit. Now, we have the first Gepard damage. I've not seen the video of this but lancet strike seems suspicious says andrew uh in in his tally there so a gepard may have been damaged uh which is interesting uh surveillance and comms couple of starlink i wouldn't actually include those on the list as i've said and i wouldn't include the ugv the young man ground vehicle so i'd take those out uh for a comparable list I'd take those decoys out and the ratio is even better. Uh, right, we've got a grad multiple launch rocket system. Uh, take uh, damaged lance it, but hit a camo net, which limited the damage. So possibly not too much uh, damage to that. We, we shall see. Uh, some tanks, unknown tanks. Two Bradleys on that. It shows that how many Bradleys they're using at the moment. So Bradleys are quite common on the lost lists. Uh, and that could signify that they have cycled through a lot of their BMPs and don't have too many BMPs left. Or it could be that they do have BMPs, but they're using Bradleys because Bradleys are better. And I was wondering about this in the counter-offensive period of last year, when the Ukrainians were holding back some of their best vehicles. You're thinking, why are you holding them back? Surely, if they're the best, you would want to use them over and above those other vehicles that you appear to be using almost as kind of not bait, but 
sacrificially. So I so there there must be different ways of looking at this. Uh, I don't know whether the the loss of the Bradleys means that they have just not got enough BMPs and older vehicles left, or it's just a better vehicle to use. So M uh, as so another senator added to that, an abandoned one, uh, destroyed M one one three. A number of those getting destroyed at the moment, uh, and that's about that. So. Yeah, not too bad a loss list there. Now we go to the Russian loss. We have a Strela 10 uh, that is a short-range air defense system that has been destroyed. Electronic warfare placed on a Desert Cross 1000-3, the golf cart, abandoned then hit by dive bomber. Um, uh, we have some uh, range of artillery there, nothing too uh, important. Some D20s, D30s, they're really old uh, artillery pieces. Then a big old list of tanks here, quite a lot of them destroyed and or abandoned, including three, four, sorry, uh, tracked garden sheds. So these are tanks, as you can see there, they know that one was a T-80, one was a T-62. Uh, they are the ones that have all the corrugated iron and all sorts of stuff built around them and used at the front of columns to often to mine roll the way through uh, Ukrainian defences, and then offload troops that are hiding un underneath and whatnot. They're using more and more of these. Uh, I don't know whether they are taking tanks that are not as able. Uh, so po possibly damage and turret damage. Because the turret can't rotate particularly. Because you have that garden shed roof over the top that, that restricts its movement. So it could be that these are damaged tanks used as best as they can be. Or you're res restricting the use of a tank in order to get a preferable outcome out of using that tank. Uh, and then you've got a number of uh, quite a variety of other tanks taken out there. But the fact that you are seeing what four of these garden sheds getting taken out is and some of them I've seen some catastrophic. I've seen quite a lot of uh, equipment that goes in line with this large list of equipment lost. I have I've seen an awful lot of footage of the last few days, but some some catastrophic explosions uh, I yeah I don't know what else it says the Russians are attacking uh, that would indicate it and that those garden sheds are no longer as because when they're using them at the beginning actually the first few times they used them the Ukrainians struggled to incapacitate them uh, they've obviously worked out ways of of taking them out um, the, of 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 getting through the the armor and whatnot then when we come to the infantry fighting vehicles list it's just a massive list there all the usual culprits bmp ones twos threes bmds btrs all these different variations of the infantry fighting vehicle um a number of them damaged about 50 percent of them damaged and 50 percent destroyed or abandoned uh there are there or thereabouts as you can see from all the ways that these are destroyed uh, a lot of them abandoned then destroyed uh, or taken out with FPVs, dive bombing drones as well, drone drop munitions, and then just uh, some unknown causes when they're found already destroyed on a field. Uh, APCs, uh, usual ones there, MTLBs, BTRs, and whatnot, Tiger M, uh, a couple of those thrown in for good measure. And then we have some trucks, uh, mine resistant ambush protection vehicle, ATV, like just a, a quad, and a whole host of civilian vehicles, including. Uh, a number of motorcycles we're seeing them being used more and more uh, and turning up on these lost lists an awful lot so yeah that is a heavy list of losses for the russians that will very much over uh compensate for those losses of the ukrainians it really is a bad day there for the russians it seems now it gets worse there's a ship that's supposedly been sunk it is a a minesweeper so not the most uh, offensive of ships for the Russians to lose. It'd be nice if they could lose a cruise missile carrier. Uh, but I guess the Ukrainians will take what they can get. And if this has been... Well, it's unknown whether this has been taken out by naval drones, as in the unmanned surface vehicles, or whether this has been taken out by uh, by aerial drones. Uh, and exactly where, where I don't know. It, possibly in the port of Sevastopol which means it's unlikely you're going to get drones into the port but you never know just we'll we'll wait and see what comes out here but that is another um another embarrassing loss for the russians in terms of their black sea fleet being just consistently degraded we've been waiting to hear about things like this so novorossiysk and sevastopol have been hit a couple of nights in a row uh we or two out of the last three nights i think it is 
Uh, we'll come on to distance strikes in a minute. There was a Su-25 that was shot down apparently yesterday. Uh, um, currently, his remains are melting in one of the Donetsk landing sites, the message reads. Anti-aircraft guns and 110th separate mechanized brigade once again shot down enemy Su-25. Uh, so that was variously reported yesterday. But as well as that, so the Russians have lost a plane. Not sure about when this happened, but there is news of Lieutenant Colonel Denis Vasilyuk, uh, the Chief of Staff and First Deputy Commander of the AFU Aviation Squadron, has died during a combat mission. Pilot of the Fighter Aviation of the Ukrainian Air Force, he's flown dozens of combat missions since the beginning of the full-scale invasion and is a holder of the Order of Courage. So, very sad news for the Ukrainian uh, Air Force there to lose an experienced pilot who has... Uh, has has flown a, uh, a number of missions so don't know what the details are of that where that was shot down what plane it it was that he was in uh, but that's going to be a, a sad loss for the ukrainians there um because of course, quite often it's it's the pilots that are the more valuable aspect to this if you think of of how long it is taking to train up ukrainian pilots for their um their flights are on board the uh, F-16s, then you know that, that they are the important aspect there. I mean, yes, Ukrainians do have a shortage of airframes and some airframes are really, really valuable. So the ones that are uh, firing off the the cruise missiles, Su-24Ms, that they uh, that they just don't have, well, they hardly have any of them, maybe just a couple. And that's why we don't see as many, possibly as many, uh, missions involving cruise missiles because it's dependent on the the airframes but generally it's the pi pilots that are the uh, more important um uh component there so the airstrike on vovchansk city hospital eliminated dozens of kadyrov's troops command of the freedom of russian legion of the call sign caesar said so What's he talking about? I showed you yesterday either a JDAM or a GLSDB. So either drop from a plane, done munition with guidance, or fired from a multiple launch rocket system, done munition with guidance. Has took out the hospital in the middle of Vovchansk. Vovchansk is in the northern, it's at that town, the larger town in one of the northern salients, the one to the east, that the Russians are at the moment working their way through. Uh, the hospital is no longer being used as a hospital. It's been all been evacuated and whatnot. The Russians appear to have been using that as some kind of headquarters. And it looks like it might have been Kadyrovites. Uh, so Ramzan Kadyrov, the, the Chechen warlord. It was his troops maybe that were stationed in the hospital. And that was, uh, you know, took a massive hit, as you can see here, from um, Ukrainian munitions. And the claim is it took do out dozens of Kadyrov's troops. Uh, likewise, there is the usage of the French hammer, uh, extended range guided glide bombs being used uh, in Kherson on the left bank of the river. This is in, um, oh, I forget where it is, uh, anyway, yeah, you can see it on the map just down river from uh, Kherson. And uh, yeah, they're using those hammer missiles effectively, which is really good news. There, there were issues with the JDANs, but these hammers seem to have don't have the issue. They're not quite the same in terms of glide capabilities of the JDANs, as far as I can work out. But they do have precision, uh, and uh, they, they are similar munitions to some degree. Um, there, there are lots of these going around at the moment of different Russian. Officers uh, perishing in strikes at the moment. This is Colonel Magomed Majanov uh, dying on the left bank of Kherson. Uh, there are a number of these that have been going around of different ones. So the Ukrainians are attriting away the Russian uh, officer corps as well as troops when they are doing these sorts of strikes. Of course, the question is always, well, what's the ratio? In, in the same way that we look at the stats over here and talk about ratios, it's the same with personnel. I mean, without wanting to reduce people to numbers, it is important to understand the capacity of each side for in terms of their personnel um, and in terms of their officer corps. Uh, so, what are the what's the ratio like with regard to Russian against Ukrainian losses? I don't know. Can't speak to that. 
Now, uh, Russians are dropping uh, here, Andrew Perpetua, and he often gets rightfully incensed about this. This is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, but they catch it on drone camera and then they release it. And you're like, the, this is a war crime. You, This is a war crime. And you are just like, yeah, look what we did. So Russians dropping an incendiary bomb on an elderly couple's house and then record the woman escaping and then and then release it. It's just uh, this is the sort of thing they do, particularly along the Dnipro River. They've been doing this for a long time. Bereslav, places like that, where they just they're just terrorizing the local population is absolutely unacceptable. But, you know, there you have a, a war crime. And in fact, we're, there's more evidence of looting in Vovchansk. I, I posted something about looting in Vovchansk the other day, and that's that northern town in Kharkiv Oblast that's being uh, in, uh, attacked. And someone was pouring, like, scepticism on that. It's like, dude, have you seen the form of the Russians? Like, it's like, oh, that's it's just a whatever. It's not necessarily um, looting. And it's like, okay, well, if, if you don't believe it... Uh, come and look at this footage of actual looting taking place um anyway we'll come to that uh so the next we're going to come on to another uh, freight train that has been derailed again containing i think fuel here five wagons of a freight train accidentally derailed near krasnoyarsk in russia i don't know whether it was accidental don't know what the cause was but this definitely works in favor of the ukrainians just uh, everywhere I look, there, there are issues for the Russians at the moment. And here's another one, St. Petersburg, somewhere just hugely on fire in St. Petersburg. I don't know whether it was accidental, whether this is uh, what, I don't even know what the place is. Um, yeah, as PS01 says, St. Petersburg has left the chat. Uh, really significant fire going on there. Yeah, it would be useful to know what it was. And then... This is just a general comment on state of affairs as far as Thomas Tyner is concerned. So he's, remember, the European ex-artilleryman that is casting his opinion quite widely and expertise on equipment uh, being used and state of affairs in uh, and during this war. He's re reacting to the depletion of Russian towed artillery uh, storage stockpiles in, back in Russia. And we've seen a lot of these satellite images that I have... Um, that I've been going through or well, he says by next year Russia will have exhausted the Soviet Union's Cold War legacy if by then the West's industry are on a war footing Russia will be crushed by summer 2025 yeah I know the West isn't going to go to wartime production our politicians don't have the brains for that so he's saying look technically I mean this this should be an easy win like it's what I keep saying like sit back, attack the Russians with all sorts of drones and missiles from a distance and artillery. Don't attrit your, your troops. Build as much stuff as you can. Get the the other allied nations to help as much as possible. Uh, train, mobilize and train. Get absolutely ready in 2025 and then go for it. Whilst having some active defense going on until 2025, keeping the initiative in your favor in certain areas. Uh, but then like properly go for it but in all that time you are massively attriting the russian uh the russians by distance munitions so this is what i've been calling for for ages and it seems uh, i mean it's pretty bloody obvious right but great news is is that is what appears to be happening exactly that while the ukrainians are mobilizing and then going to be concerning themselves with training getting f-16s ready as well etc etc uh they are also building enough uh, attack drones for example and getting hold of cruise missiles and hopefully building their own missiles that they're getting to the point where they can do this often and i was saying i'm waiting so i was getting frustrated a few weeks back saying well hang on the ukrainians are saying that they can build attack drones now at the same number uh, that russia can build these attack drones so sh shahid equivalents whatever they may be, the Lyuti, for example, that the Ukrainians are using. So they can build these at the same rate, and yet we're still seeing only three or four drones being used on that refinery, and then a couple of nights later, three or four. What's going on here? Either they're lying or they're stockpiling, and the latter appears to be the case, because we've had uh, two nights ago, sorry, three nights ago, wasn't it, a uh, 100 drones used in an attack, and then two nights later... Uh, uh, another possibly 100 drones used in another massive attack on Crimea and on Russia. 
And if if Ukraine can keep doing this, if this can be a regular occurrence, honestly, the Russians are. If this goes on for a couple of months, well, just a couple of weeks, the 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 Russians can be seriously seriously hurting. And the issue then is, you know, what I call the Putin paradox: the more that Putin loses, the, the more he is existentially challenged, the more likely he is to do something mental. So you do have that issue, but that shouldn't hold you back from defending your own country and doing exactly this. So Russian channels reporting again last night that approximately 100 to 120 drones um, were, and this was Tendai reporting, are currently en route, so this was last night, to Russian occupied Crimea as well as regions uh, around Rostov and Krasnodar. Several explosions have already been heard in Crimea. So there are various claims about all sorts going on last night. Uh, Max23 reporting that the Russian MOD are saying, or said, 57 drones were intercepted over the Krasnodar territory overnight. Nine ATACMS missiles and one drone were destroyed over Crimea. Three more drones over Belgorod region and 57 over the Krasnodar uh, territory, the military department uh, reported. So it's quite a lot of 57s going on uh, on there. Uh, and that's the same 57. So, I mean, yeah, they always claim that they shoot everything down. ATACMS claim of nine ATACMs being shot down is incredibly unrealistic. They they keep claiming or they shoot down all the ATACMs and then it turns out the ATACMs hit all their targets and there's no evidence ever presented that ATACMs have been shot down. So you would imagine that if the Russians had evidence of that, they'll be absolutely throwing it about, saying, look what we did to an ATACMs. And yet these 30, 40-year-old missiles uh, can get through Russian air defences and do what they do, evidently, because we are seeing the outcome in terms of S-300 and S-400 systems being taken out, airframes being taken out, old depots or, or fuel depots on airports being taken out. It is, this is a, a real issue. In fact, you know, as I, I mentioned this yesterday, but that, that fuel depot at the Belbeck Airport being completely destroyed. And I was saying, this can stop Belbeck operating basically going forward well actually Igor Sushko you know, pinch of salt with him often but absolutely right here Ukraine destroyed the entire jet fuel storage facility at Russia's Belbet air base in occupied Crimea the capacity is reportedly 450,000 litres the adjacent building housing fuel trucks also destroyed incapacitating any near-term operation f operations from this base it, essentially that alone takes out Belbet from being used arguably so as the as the Russians are taking are losing their S four hundred S three hundred air defense systems and particularly radars, the Ukrainians are more and more able to fire their their missiles and drones into Crimea or across Crimea and into Krasnodar or the, which is this area or further down to hit say to Apse. You know they can they can know what the safe pathways now because they've destroyed those air defense capabilities well Trentsilenko says it appears that the stockpile of uh, Shahid 136 class drones in other words what I was talking about earlier they've been building these what supposedly where are they well the stockpile of these drones has been building up for months and is now being expended after Belbek air base in Crimea was suppressed by ATACM's strikes there's a big hole in the VKS so the Russian Air Force defenses for a Samba line of propeller cruise missiles to fly through so as we saw from footage uh, down in Tuapsi, I think it was, or no, it was uh, no Novorossiysk, I think it was, where someone was filming and said, "I've just seen eighty of these go across in a line, just drones, one after the other." This Samba line of drones, this Congo line of drones, just going over and over and over. And of course, if you are depleting the Russian air defence, then you are you are able to do that with impunity. Jane Kiev says, in what must be the largest attack on Crimea to date, explosions covering essentially every main Russian military hotspot on the peninsula in the past hour. Shankoy, Sevastopol, Simferopol, Yevpatoria, Kiroskoya, Saki, and more. Air bases and other uh, key points there. Now, there is very little information about the damage being done other than that, that ship and there are explosions caught on camera. Uh, Sevastopol is under missile attack, said War Translated last night. The Russian occupied governor says there's no damage done, while Ukrainian media mentioned a strike on a Russian ship. Um, so that would be that that minesweeper. So Tim threads, uh, Tim White's thread is 
uh, pretty decent here. Let's just uh, refresh that because there might be a few more bits on top of that. For So we're just going to go through this way because he kind of gives a nice um, uh, chronology of what, what we learned. So starting uh, with Viborg in northwest Russia. So this is a long way away in the north northwest of, of Russia up sort of towards Finland, St. Petersburg way. In fact, less than 50 kilometers from the border with Finland and well over 1,000 kilometers from Ukraine, drones seem to have hit an oil depot. So that's the first bit. Then all major news outlets in Russia are already reporting the incident in Viborg. Locals heard a very loud explosion soon after smoke started rising from the oil depot in the city with flames clearly visible. No comment yet from officials about the suspected Ukraine attack. Now, if that's come from Ukraine, where, where, what air defense doing? Right, those drones have gone all that way to the Finnish border almost to strike a target there and they unhindered. Similar story over 2,000 kilometers south where another oil refinery in Russia has mysteriously erupted in flames. The plant in Slavyansk na Kubani in Krasnodar Krai, so that's much closer to Crimea, has been hit. Previously, Russia, uh, pre it has been hit previously. Russia's lack of air defense in Crimea these days seems to allow drones free hits so that has been shown uh to have been hit in fact the claim is that that has been um knocked out so temporarily stopped work after a massive attack at slavyansk uh, oil refinery uh, and there are various videos of explosions and whatnot going on there uh, Tim White continues, there may be more bad news for Russia, also in Krasnodar, about 200 kilometers northeast of the Slavyansk gold depot, depot, is a military airfield and encampment at Kuschevskaya. Russia optimistically says five drones were shot down with no hits to the camp, but we know what Russia often say about this. But ha having said that, there should be some decent air defense around a military air base, you would think. Um, uh, Russia's Ministry of Disinformation has finally woken up to reassure its gullible public, says Tim White. No Ukraine attack on Viborg, they say. Uh, there just happened to be a ban because of the use of pyrotechnics on the plant, obviously. Uh, so that's a claim, just pyrotechnics that have resol resulted in uh, lots of smoke uh, and flames on an oil depot uh, in Viborg. But there you go. Russia is eager to explain away the two events in Krasnodar 2. An official statement says Ukraine attacked civilian targets, which is demonstrably uh, lies. They say 10 drones were suppressed. One fell, out, fell on the oil refinery in Slavyansk. Uh, the video may show a drone hit. So uh, it's a significant explosion. Oh, it's not that one. There's another one that's a really big explosion. Uh, in Kuschevsky village, where a military airfield is to be found, Russia admits a fire, again blaming debris from a shot from a Ukrainian drone. Authorities in Krasnodar say it did not affect populated areas. That may be true, as it seems to have hit a military camp. And then this is a larger explosion I was talking about. Uh, a nice video showing the absolute lies of Russia regarding the oil refinery here at Slavyansk. Apparently no drones hit the plant. One drone fell after being shot. Well, you can make up your own mind. A really significant explosion, like massive explosion there. Um, Russia on fire. Some firefighters spent all evening and most of the night tackling a blaze in St. Petersburg. That's the one that I was showing you earlier. They say the blaze was at a workshop with polyethylene in the Primorsky district. Uh, again, don't know what caused that. Also drone activity in Belgorod in Russia, just across the border from Kharkiv. Uh, local officials claim the roof of a church was hit by a kamikaze drone in the village of Maloya Gorostishish. Uh, back in Ukraine, uh, the drones launched by Russia still threaten the Odessa region. So, oh, I've not got that. Where is that? So there were, I'm sure we're going to come to that in a, in a wee while. Yes. So Russia did send 37 drones into Ukraine last night. And all 37 were shot down. So assuming that's true, and of course there might be an element where Ukraine are not telling the truth, but they generally seem to be, like when you have really poor interception rates, they tell you, and then we go, oh, well, that's rubbish interception rates. So it, it appears that they are pretty genuine about certainly drone interceptions. But the last few nights, the last week, we have seen 100% drone interception rates. And that's another example. And by all accounts, that was all over Russia, uh, all over Ukraine, these drones. So there wasn't just all sent in one area. Um, there were 37 drones sent all around Ukraine. 
and they were all supposedly shot down. Uh, really important there for the Ukrainians to be able to do that. Uh, drones were launched uh, against the desert, on a mosque, all sorts of different areas. Um, so a very busy night. Uh, uh, anything else? Just to, uh, uh, yeah, no, that's the Kovrovets, the um, mine sweep. I thought he was saying there's a second one uh, that was destroyed. Uh, that would have been quite incredible. Um, so explosions near Odessa, the Russians trying to cause issues to Ukrainians. I don't know if there were any missiles. So what I will say about the Ukrainians is they haven't been reporting their missile strikes on Ukraine recently. Uh, so there could be, I don't know whether there w were any um, missile strikes. Because, well, here the claim is from Tim White, explosions on the outskirts of Kharkiv. Eight wounded are known so far as what thought to, what's thought to be a ballistic missile strike. Uh, quite often, Kharkiv is hit by S-300 surface-to-air missiles fired from Belgorod. Um, then we've got imagery coming from Novorossiysk of just one fuel uh, tank being hit the other day. But I d that might not have even got through the tank. I don't know. Um, so, uh, patriotic Ukraine group Atesh, the partisans, have spotted that the ruined S-400 defense system has not yet been moved from Jankoy. Uh, they say it's because Russia has problems with logistics and resource management, likely as short as Ukraine on air defense systems. Uh, so that was what was hit previously. So you had Jankoy and Belbek Air, air Base both having S-400, S-300, S-400 systems uh, taken out around there. Um, what else? Uh, the, talking about the derailment of that um, of that railway. Uh, this is one we're going to come on to in a second. Yeah, and that's pretty much that. Uh, the Russians have hit a, a holiday place in Kharkiv, uh, injuring people, um, the, to killing four people. Uh, so, yeah, n injury uh, to ten uh, to number wounded is fifteen. Sorry, official death toll is four. Um, but local journal journalists say five, and it's a recreation center that was hit by the Russians in Kharkiv. Uh, so that's pretty terrible. Um, so, Slavyansk refinery, I talked to you about that. That's no longer operational. Now, this is footage of the port of Novorossiysk, allegedly from this morning. They celebrate that they struck a drone, but, but look how they strike the drone. So they do hit the drone by the looks of it, but the drone is really low to the the target where it's going and in order to hit that drone they are absolutely spraying with the all these little sprites here i, I probably i won't show it because i'll probably get restricted but these are all rounds coming from where the camera is they're firing across the uh, across the port here and therefore they'll be littering all of those buildings and of course that's what you've got to do if you want to hit the drone and stop it doing that then you kind of got to do that but they'll be causing all sorts of damage to another receipt just with the use of air defense there as Tendai says, footage allegedly from this morning, they celebrate that they strike the drone, but they spray their own city as well as port facilities with hundreds of anti-air bullets. And those are not just like your little rounds that you shoot from an AK-47. These are these are big bits of, you know, you see those rounds in the Gepard and they are, what, $600 a piece to, to, to buy those, those rounds for the Gepard. So you firing, if you're firing those up into the air, that's, okay especially out in the out in the countryside and then expended casings will will fall fall down or whatever but uh you fire those into buildings to into at a drone that's flying at the height of the of the buildings it's trying to strike then there's going to be some trouble there for sure right then uh, there will be news sort of coming out concerning all of that activity today and i'm sure there'll be more information on what targets were hit uh now this is the russian looters that pulling up in in a van in a flatbed and loading it up with stuff they're looting in vovchansk so in northern kharkiv region the russians are oh committing more war crimes uh because russia ukraine's drones Drone strikes on Russian energy infrastructure earlier this year disrupted 14% of the country's oil refining capacity. So that was thought at the time. There's now been more analysis to say, yep, 14% of oil refining capacity. It drove up domestic fuel prices, but interestingly had minimal impact on electricity output. So 
why that's interesting for me is because we have seen in the last week substations be targeted more and more and i think that this was about trying to upset the russian um, hydrocarbons industry ability to fund the war but they're also now starting to hit substations which will be the ability to i don't know whether these are key substations like one around Novorossiysk it's not going to be right we don't we want to stop the Russians getting electricity which is kind of what the Russians are doing to the Ukrainians I would imagine the Ukrainians are going to be very uh, precise with their substation hits which is like we're not trying to hurt the Russian population in terms of how they live we want to hit substations in key places that that offer energy to for example the Black Sea Fleet in Novorossiysk so Novorossiysk is going to be a key place to hit the energy infrastructure but I could be wrong. Uh, judging from the increasing amount of Russian soldiers and their families' complaints about the lack of payments, it seems Russian Defence Ministry doesn't plan on these guys living long enough to be paid, says Jay and Keith. Russian channels are flooded with this stuff now. And I've seen a lot of complaints as well. There's a video that's just come out. You saw it flash by, flash by on Tim White's thread when I was going past it there. But as, as a guy complaining, he, he's been injured and he's gone back. And he's absolutely... You know, he's disgusted and he's he's having a right go at Putin and saying, you know, about the payment situation particularly. Yeah, it's not good. And there's a lot of discontent, not only with the soldiers, but with their families as well and friends. And so that's what you want from a Ukrainian point of view. You want that to spread. Right, going up to the Sumi region, Dragon's Teeth, these big piles of Dragon's Teeth that people are whinging about. And rightly so. Sorry, whinging is maybe a bit but the wrong term. They are, they're rightfully complaining about. Uh there is now someone on camera saying, don't worry, they're going to be installed soon. Thank you for all your uh, for spreading the word, says Max23. And I think in light of people complaining of shots like this, uh, this is very embarrassing for the Ukrainian administrations. And so they're like, uh, yeah, better get onto that. Uh, there will be a new counteroffensive, says Zelensky. First, it's necessary to stabilize, uh, stabilize the front and equip the brigades. Now it's their turn. The president added, I would just say, yeah, 2025, I think you'd be nuts to see any major. I think you, you'll you see the Ukrainians push. It was It's a really important point that was made recently. I can't remember who it was. Um, uh, was it was it Anders Puck Nielsen? No, I don't think it was. Someone was, was talking about that I shared with you. It's was talking about how the, the Ukrainians need to maintain initiative somewhere. You can't just sit back and suck it all up uh, because you, you're basically saying to the Russians, you do what you want to do and we'll just deal with it. At some at some point, you need to be taking things to the Russian to make them change their behaviour and make them not be able to do what they want to do. So it, it, it's a kind of not quite active defence, but it, it, it's it's very localised attacks along the front line that Ukraine might might end up doing before they do any major counteroffensive. And I'd expect that, but that's they won't be like, scare quotes, counteroffensives. You know, they'll just be localized attacks for for tactical oper and operational. Um, well, you could argue strategic uh, reasons. So, you know, that's what we need to do to keep the Russians guessing so that we can then build up our our own capabilities to to hit. Uh, but we've, we've kept the Russians from being able to dictate everything that goes on in the meantime. Um, yeah. And and I think. You know the what we've seen today, uh, last night, and over the last week with the Ukrainians absolutely hammering the Russians from a distance. You know the question is, how much damage did the Ukrainians do last night? How many troops did the Ukrainians lose themselves? I'd assume they lost zero troops. That is exactly the kind of ratio you want because although although this looks good from a ukrainian point of view right this is this is a good day of ratios you are losing stuff and you are losing troops and ideally if you can do kind of damage like that i mean ideally if you can do damage to russian equipment without losing any of your troops so it, that's going to be you know overwhelming uh, the russians with drones like they are in a much longer distance then then they need to just keep doing that but these long distance strikes are so good for the Ukrainians because 
They are not losing any troops. They're just building up these drones and firing them into into Russia. And if they can have uh, a, an asymmetry with regard to production, if they can have, with the help of the, the combined Western military industrial output and and their own military industrial output do this like what three times a week for the next six months uh, russia are going to be in for a really really difficult time um and good news on the sporting front so i, I have to talk about this tyson fury who is a big fella has bigger reach it was expected to win this, Usk. Um, uh, well, a uh, terribly hard one, well deserved victory. A split decision it was in the end, but he did win and is now the undisputed uh, heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And that's huge. And not just that, but he then went and watched his countrymen win the world lightweight championship 8,000 miles away. So that's two Ukrainian boxing victories in one night uh absolutely brilliant so well done to ukraine and they'll be that this will give him a right morale boost um particularly that that heavyweight victory really significant there uh and they're possibly going to be a rematch later this year in maybe even wembley or somewhere we shall see that i think that was in saudi arabia which is not exactly the the heart of uh, boxing um, a bit like they're uh, taking, trying to get all the players to play, pay them crazy money to play in Saudi Arabia. But I don't think, I don't think you can manufacture that kind of culture, uh, sporting wise. Anyway, I digress completely. Uh, let uh, that is today's news. There will be an awful lot more to add on to that, and I'll try and keep you posted if there's anything significant throughout the day. Uh, it has been another big night for the uh, for the Ukrainians. The Russians have uh, taken a bit of a beating. Uh, that just to let you know, that looks like the Russian uh, um, minesweeper on fire there. Uh, cover of Rets. So uh, as I say, the, these kind of images are going to continue coming out uh, all day. Um, anyway, uh, oh. Probably nothing, says Tim White, but it's just been announced Honduras's ambassador uh, in Russia has died suddenly. Juan Salgado's body is to be repatriated shortly. No cause of death has been given. Not for the first time, that. Um, okay, so there you go. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe and share if you could. Uh, it's been another big bumper news night. Uh, take care and I'll speak to you soon.